Hey, Regina. Hello. How are you? Good. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Good. Yeah. I don't have any video on. Sorry. That's okay. President That's okay. computers aren't that fancy. So Chris told me you guys were opening up uh, clinics and, and labs this week. Is, is that right? We are, yeah. Um, the, just for simplicity, residents aren't doing in-person clinic yet because that would be kind of a nightmare um, as we're trying to keep numbers down. Um, our patients are all kind of simultaneously canceling and clamoring to be seen, so <laughs> yeah. But yeah, we're the EMU's been open for a couple weeks. Um, how are how are things KPI? We're uh, hey Ben, we're um, we're doing well. We're largely uh, off site, although some obviously some essential things like backlift and pumps have to be on site for the outpatient right. world. But um, we're starting the planning process for our ramping up will be gradual there's yeah. we're not intending on um flipping a switch mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. there's so the clinical venues are so varied that right. there's no way to do it in a sort of a singular approach so mm -hmm. yeah yeah but our inpatient we we never shut down the unit we thankfully haven't had any um nosocomial or uh or any other kind of patient covid activity yeah yeah that's great uh, yeah, that would be really bad i know some not not barnes or anybody but some of our inpatient psychiatry units in missouri have had outbreaks which has been really scary yeah. We'll give it another minute or so as people uh, are connecting up.
Hey, Brenda. Thanks for joining. I think we uh, probably can get started. So I'm Brad Schlager. I'm uh, the program director for the CNCDP K-12 program. I'm also president and CEO of Kennedy Krieger Institute where the grant sits. And on the call today also is Amber Huggins, who's our program administrator. I'm not sure if Jackie will be joining us. Uh, she's a research programs operations person at Kennedy Krieger, and she's also the person that you would work with once you've uh, landed the award, and take, she takes care of the sub-award process and so on. So this is a information, informal information mechanism for helping you to understand how to go about writing for this uh, award. I thought I'd start out with a little bit of a, of a history just to give you some background on where, how we got to where we are today. So the NINDS funded K-12 mechanism for child neurologists goes back to the early 90s when it was called the Neurological Sciences Academic Development Award, uh, called the ENSADA for short. I think the first year of funding was 1993. It went it lasted through 2019, although it overlapped for a few years with the current form of the award. Many of the people that you know in uh, child neurology who are physician scientists, including myself, were funded on this ENSADA mechanism. The first years from the early 90s to, to uh, I should first say that th these awards, when it was ENSADA, they were institution-based. So eight to 10 over the years, different institutions would land these awards and then be able to, to hand them out to uh, worthy recipients at their own institutions. Uh, I was on the award at Washington University in the uh, mid 90s and then eventually became the program director there um, between 2008 and 2018 before moving to Kennedy Krieger. The first portion of the ENSADA, it was a five year K-12 award that looked a lot like the individual K awards that you apply for competitively, the K-08 and K-23, for example. They were five-year awards and the intent was to transition from the K-12 to R-01. Sometime in the mid to, uh, at the end of the first decade of 2000s, we tr uh, transitioned to a three-year award and the notion of the K-12, this version, transition to becoming more of a pre-K. Three years of funding with the intent of getting you to write your own K08 or K23. That was the NINDS's intent of making that transition. It was still institution-based, not a national program, but intended to get you from uh, pre-K or K12 to your own individual K. The intent of the child neurologist career development version of this when it went from the ENSADA to the current version was to democratize it basically, to make it not institution-based but to make it available nationally because there clearly were, were the applicants who are at institutions that did not have the, the award and therefore didn't have access to it. And so the notion was that we would be able, to, NINDS would be able to support the most um, uh, worthy K-12 recipient uh, applicants across all uh, institutions through a centralized mechanism. And there had already been a couple of versions of this national K-12 approach. Uh, pediatric critical care had it for uh, several years before we did, and uh, neurosurgery did as well. So um, in 2016, the first CNCDB K-12 got funded. It, was, it landed at Kennedy Krieger. Mike Johnston was the program director. Uh, he has since retired. And uh, with that in my transition to Kennedy Krieger, I, I took on the, the leadership of the award. And then just in the last uh, year, back in um, around Labor Day, we submitted the renewal for the next cycle for the CNCDB K-12. We're heading into our fifth year uh, of funding right now. Okay, so that's background. So the purpose of it is to take pediatric neurologists and NDD trained physicians, 
upon completion of the residency training program who are in intent on becoming physician scientists to have a three year period of intensive, clinically relevant, basic and or patient oriented research. It's up to three years. It's, uh, it's, it's described as a th three year program, but um, it is the case that if you are able to get your individual K award earlier, you can, you can do so and then you come off the K-12. Or if after three year, after two years, you clearly are not making progress on it, the third year is not a guaranteed uh, funding. So there, it's, it's uh, contingent, but the framing of it is, is a three-year award. And again, the goal is preparation for your own individual K-08 or K-23 or other like career development award. Eligibility. This is a letter of the law. You have to be a US citizen or a lawful permanent resident. And there's requirement of proof at the time of letter of intent. We said no more than five years from completion of, of your clinical training. So if you did your child neurology and then you did an epilepsy fellowship, say, it's at the end of your fellowship. It's, it's at, the, at the completion of your formal clinical training. We take exceptions for compelling reasons, but the driving force from the NINDS is to, to, to take people who are ready and raring to go to do their, to, to be physician scientists and not who have um, meandered. So we, every year we, we hear uh, uh, petitions to, to, to make an exception to the five-year rule. I'll just, Straightforwardly, the first uh, year or two, we, we were pretty lenient, but um, it turned out that most of the individuals who, uh, who, who we opened the door to when the applications just weren't as compelling. So over time, we have become more uh, focused on the intent of having the target audience, the, the target applicant being within the first uh, couple of years outside of their clinical training. You have to be appointed as a faculty member, as instructor or assistant professor at a US academic institution once the funding has started. So again, there's a three year period. The salary is up to $85,000 a year for a minimum of 75% effort. I think that number needs to be corrected. It's gone up for the next cycle, uh, for the next cycle, but for the, this last, year of a current cycle, it's 85,000 a year for a minimum of 75% effort devoted to career development and research. And then there's an additional uh, a bolus of money of $38,000 for research related expenses, including travel. So what's the expectation? At least 75% of your time devoted to research and career development funded by the K-12. And there's an asterisk there because for most salaries, that, that $85,000 is not going to cover 75% effort. So the institution has to back the rest of it. Uh, there have been examples where there's been a, a wrestling match where, where the institution is, shows that they're trying to um, not back the rest of it. That it's really a requirement. Uh, if the institution doesn't support making the rest, that 75% whole, uh, adding on to what the K-12 provides, then it's a demonstration of lack of institutional support, which is not a good thing. We say research and career development, and the research itself is, is obviously important, but there's an entire career development plan that has to be in place in tandem that we consider to be just as important in the overall picture. Uh, so the effort is, is rounded out as research and career development. No more than 25% of, of your time can be spent doing things that are not in the category of research and career development. That means that you can't say, I'm gonna do 25% clinical and 75% is protected because anybody who's a faculty member has additional responsibilities 
beyond their seeing patients and then their protected time. They have obligations that are part of being a faculty member. So if the numbers add up to 25% of clinical activity, we will read that out as insufficient protected time and uh, re require adjustments to be made. So um, the, there's a, also a guarantee of a minimum of 50% protected time and salary for at least 18 months after the three-year funding period, so long as uh, the candidate or the scholar has made reasonable progress during the three years of funding. <clears throat> so the letter of support from the institution has to delineate all of these elements uh, con convincingly. The way the program works is that each scholar, after you get funded, has an assigned advisor for that full funding period. And we have a, a roster of nearly 20 faculty of uh, physician scientists from across the country. And we pull from them to assign an advisor that's yours throughout the time that you're on the award. These are individuals that have uh, careers that demonstrate their prowess, not just as physician scientists, but also as mentors. You'll have quarterly interactions with your CNCDB advisor. There'll be in-person site visits the first year, and then uh, subsequent to that, virtual visits, unless there's the, a need for a site visit subsequently. And then the expectation is that you as a scholar would participate at the annual meeting and that annual meeting is, is yoked to the, child, the annual Child Neurology Society meeting each fall. The, our retreat or meeting is in the two to two and a half day period that just precedes the uh, Child Neurology Society meeting. Okay, so what's coming is the, the deadline for the letter of intent. And the way you uh, configure your letter of intent is there has to be a statement of intent which includes the title, date of completion of your clinical training, name of your institution, mentors, brief, and a brief career development plan. And then your specific aims. And then if you've previously submitted and went through the process, but were not selected as a scholar and you're coming back again, which is fine, you have to explain how your work was modified from the previous year, the previous application, and that you also have to explain why a year later you are still a candidate for a pre-K award and that you're not, uh, why you're not ready to submit your own individual K, K-08 or K-23. You need uh, NIH uh, formatted biosketches bio for yourself and for the mentors, and then a pre, uh, proof of your uh, passport or green card. So merge all the files into one PDF, submit it uh, to CNCDP, K12 at KennedyKrieger.org. Amber monitors that email address, and uh, it's due Monday, June 15th, 2020. You will receive a confirmation email. So then what happens? Well, all of those letters of intent will be reviewed by an executive committee of the CNCDP which includes uh, a group of us that have been working together even when we were ANSADA directors prior to the CNCDP. I think I see that Brenda Porter is on the call. She, she's um, um, on the group. And there's also Barry Kosofsky, Amy brooks Kyle, Erica Augustine, Heather Fullerton, John Mink, and myself. We will review those and come to a determination of who can be invited for a full application, and you'll be notified by June 26th. And then all applicants, regardless of whether you've been invited to, sub to submit a full application or not, will be invited to participate in a grant writing webinar uh, led by uh, Rick McGee, who's at Northwestern uh, University in Chicago. That'll be on June 30th, the exact time is to be determined. That's a how do you write a grant effectively overall webinar. It's, it's not limited to the K-12, although the intended uh, audience is really the, the K-12 applicant. And then the full applications will be due Monday, August 24th. 
so there's a, there's a number of very commonly asked questions, and uh, let's let's go through those before um, before we are some chat questions. You can't. Okay, so let me just climb into one of the questions that came up already. Can you hold an institutional KL2 at the same time as the K12? You may not. In fact, if you had a KL2 previously, you can't submit uh, for the K for the, this K12. Uh, any career development award uh, is a uh, is is uh, a non-starter for applying for this K12. It means you you are ready to go on to the next level. And will these slides be posted online? Yes, we can do that. We can make it available on the um, CNCDB website. And then links to this video uh, and discussion are, will also be made available. OK, so this is the um, one of the most common questions asked is, can I apply for my K-12 award at, a, at an individual K at the same time? And the answer is technically yes. There's no rule against it, but we don't recommend it. So just to be clear, the decision making about okay. who gets- If it has the thing in the top, it means it's being recorded, right? Oh, it's being recorded, yeah. yeah. Oh, I hear some uh, questions. I, I think it's being recorded. It is. Good, okay. So um, we make the decisions about who gets awarded the K-12. Uh, it has, there's no interaction with NINDS or uh, NIH Center for Scientific Review. It's our, it's our call. And while you, so by the letter, you can do this. You can submit both at the same time. But we would say that a better strategy for, for a couple of reasons is to use the review process and the experience of the CNCDB uh, re review mechanism to bolster the quality of your individual K award application. It's a, it's a thorough review process for both your science as well as your career development plan. And then you can go through that and then submit your uh, full KOA, K23, the, the next grant cycle. The other reason, and this is more of a conceptual one, is that if you're, making an argument for why you are deserving of a pre-K award to set you up for your individual K, and you're simultaneously saying that you're ready for your individual K, you have a bit of a, um, of a dual argument going on, and which is fine, you, you can do that. It's just that the, um, the, the argument really is that uh, the K-12 is for somebody who's not ready yet to write for their individual K. And again, you can't have both a CNCDP award and a, any other like NIH funding at the same time. You, you can be a co-I on somebody else's grant. That's okay. You just can't have your own K award or certainly not an R level funding award. Can you move to a different institution after you've put in your application or even uh, landed your award? And the answer is yes. Again, we are the ones who are making a decision about um, the funding and the ongoing funding. So this simply requires uh, submitting an institutional letter of support for your new institution and basically describing how your new mentorship team is, is gonna be uh, appropriately and um, adequately configured. We've had several, I think there've been three over this first four years who have done just that, um, moved, uh, after both after they've received funding and and just prior to receiving funding, um, question came in: Is it uh, is it preferable to have an appointment as an instructor at the time of application, or is it sufficient to have an appointment after funding begins? So, if you're a resident or a fellow, and you're putting in your letter of intent. Uh, in anticipation of joining the faculty, there just has to be a letter of institutional support saying you are joining the faculty. And that, and importantly, 
that your protected time is not contingent upon receiving this award. We can, we can go back to that point later. But if you're being hired as a clinician and the institution says, yeah, we'll, we'll protect your time once you get the funding, but until then, you're doing eight half days of clinic a week, we'll see that as not demonstrating an institutional commitment to you as a future physician scientist. So you don't have to have your faculty appointment at the time of submission. You just have to have the faculty appointment at the time of, um, of, of uh, this, the funding starting. Oops. Okay, what's a, <clears throat> what's a reasonable work breakdown for a faculty position? So you have to have 75% of your full-time effort dedicated to research and career development. So how, what about the rest of that 25% effort? Like I said, you, you can't say I'm 25% clinical, 75% research. It's not that simple because there's other activity that you do in addition to seeing patients, compliance work and, and other obligations. And then you, you have to be able to describe what your clinical effort is, a half day per week standard is 10% effort. I think virtually every institution I'm aware of views it that way and uh, the NINDS defines it that way. One week of full-time service is 2%, a month or four weeks is 8%. There's some variability across institutions, but that's the, the, the standard sort of modal way of describing effort. So, sorry, so I think, um, Half day of clinic a week, uh, one month a year on service, or uh, five weeks a year on service, and then 5% effort for administrative time, and your 75% protect, protected time is, is a pretty standard way of describing your activity. I highly recommend that you are not the clinical director of such and such. If you're the clinical director of the headache clinic, that doesn't sound like somebody who's got protected time to be a physician scientist. If you are a residency director or associate residency director, that doesn't sound like you've got protected time. In a prior era, you can get away with that, but it's not the case now. We, we, we are very intent, as is the NIH, at making sure that you really are protected by your institution so that you can uh, you take advantage of that period to get your footing and become an independent investigator. Vacation time has to be prorated. So if you get four weeks of vacation and you're 75% of research and clinical development, no more than or career development, no more than three weeks can come from that period of your effort. And you can't call on call duties as protected time. What's a good startup package? It's a hard call to make, it's, it's, but in general, we would say that you should be a in a tenure eligible faculty position. Most places don't, uh, at the assistant professor, indicate uh, that it's a, it's a tenure track or not, but tenure eligible. You should get something on the order of thirty dollars to $50,000 a year of additional support towards your project makes it pretty compelling. There needs to be this commitment of 18 months of additional support, as stated, of at least 50% effort covered. And you need, it needs to be clear that there's a commitment to getting you to independent space, independent space and additional startup if you get your K08 or K23. Those awards are great for salary. They're pretty good for salary, but they're not great for the, the funding necessary to, um, to carry out the research quite often. You've got a portfolio of projects and you, you're, you've got a lot of data for one, and, but you're really keen to work on another. What should you write your grant on? Definitely the strongest data drives the strongest application. Save the, bit, the other idea perhaps for your individual K. Do you need data? Well, technically no, but grant reviewers, it's a really hard time for them to turn off that 
part of their uh, their uh, consideration if the the data seems to be a weak or non-existent so it's better to have data do you have to have a paper published in the area uh, that you're right that you're applying for technically you don't it's better if you do should i wait a year if i'm still eligible or go in with less data the the the, the rule of, of thumb is really as soon as you can submit a well-designed and well-written and well-supported application do it don't don't uh don't waste time don't wait go for it as soon as you reach th threshold how, how bad is it to go in again with an improved proposal that was not funded we have several scholars uh, out of the first uh roughly 18 or 19 that we funded so far who have reapplied after initial unsuccessful applications you have to indicate what you've done differently in response and again why a year later you're still a candidate and you're not ready a year later to write for an individual level k award can you uh can we double up at, diff at the same institution we have no rule against it but we're kind of biased against clustering too much remember that the national program the idea of it was to democratize the uh, the accessibility for this funding mechanism across institutions and, and we've done that pretty successfully over half of the scholars are from institutions that come from that come from institutions that in recent years had not had an ensada award so again no rule against it but it's um we're trying to avoid that kind of crowding what what do you look for in an institutional mentor it's really important for your mentor to have NIH funding and to have a demonstrated track record as a mentor. <clears throat> and their bio sketch needs to say that. That personal statement in the bio sketch, they can say all the wonderful things about all what they're going to do on your behalf in their letter of support, but they, there has to be somewhere in the letter of support or in the bio sketch or both that says, I have a track record as a mentor. Um, as a reviewer, if I, when I don't see those, I worry, as, as you might imagine. You can have members of your team that are not NIH funded or that don't have as much mentorship experience but bring a different kind of expertise to the team. But at the core, there really needs to be somebody who understands how the NIH system works, who understands how to mentor a physician scientist, and as you describe your mentorship team, you, you highlight what it is about the different uh, members of that team and what they contribute to the, the overall uh, package. Oops. Yes, bio sketches are, are needed from uh, your mentors. It's uh, again, for the reasons stated, we, we need to understand what what they're bringing to the team and and um, and what uh, how they make up this entire uh, mentorship team. It's not a, re a requirement in, in by the letter, but it's a really good idea. Anytime you're you're any application you have where you're suggesting that somebody is going to be a mentor for you, and there's no information for the evaluator to understand why that person is going to be a good mentor <clears throat> it it um, works against you i think so who's the best contact <clears throat> for technical or practical questions just send your questions to this uh, email address that amber monitors and our executive committee looks at them and does our best to answer them in a timely manner how long should your um, career development section for the LOI be? Probably about a paragraph. There's not a lot of room, but probably about a paragraph. <clears throat> so you're submitting, you can submit your um, application online. You can email it to the email address. There's a portal for submission either way 
<clears throat> but you should know that at your own local institution, there may be a requirement for you to notify them in advance of your submission and a, a mechanism to look at um, and your, look at it in your grants and contracts office. So know what your local policies are. Uh, on our side, we only need to know that, that you have the letter of intent, not that it passed a, a threshold at your, at your own institution. Um, how many letters of support from the, the mentors? Uh, I mean, up to three mentors, I think is, letters of support from up to three mentors is reasonable. So the budget is, is not something that we need to see in, in detail. It's predetermined by the, the grant mechanism. So you don't need to include a budget. Your own institution, for the reasons stated a moment ago, might require it. So be prepared to justify the, the budgeting, but we don't need to see it for the um, letter of intent or for the, the full grant submission. You can include it, but it's not a, a requirement. And what's the recent applicant success rate for being awarded on the first attempt? Uh, it's, uh, it's really competitive. It's, it's on the order of uh, 20 to 25%. So it's, it's not, it's actually more competitive than the individual K award. So what's the reason to go for it? Why not just go for the individual K? It's a good question. The, um, there's an entire program that comes along for the ride with the CNCDP. In addition to the funding itself, there's a, a curriculum, there's uh, webinars in the interim between the uh, annual meetings, there's the uh, access to the advisor system, there's the annual meeting itself where you are part of a, a peer group that, that moves along together gets to know each other, critiquing each other's work, creating a, a network that will uh, outlast the, the, certainly the three years that you're, that you're on the award. So there's all this other added value to being on the K-12. There's also added value to being an applicant, even if you're not funded. We consider the success of the K-12 program to not be limited to the success of those that happen to be selected for funding. We think that the overall program is helping to, to uh, bolster all who are, are interacting with it. That's, that's the argument that we make to the NINDS about why there should be a program and why this money shouldn't just be added back into the pool of uh, institute, NIH institute driven uh, individual K awards. It's because there's an overall uh, benefit to everybody who's involved, both the funded and non-funded, the funded scholars and the non-funded applicants. And I think that if you talk to others who have uh, been applicants and didn't necessarily get funded or got funded on the next try, they'll describe the same way, that there's a, an enrichment that comes from being part of this, this overall program. So um, that's my prepared comments. We're uh, happy to see so many of you on the call today. It looks like over 20. I hope we get to see all your letters of intent and I'm happy to uh, open things up to, to questions. Um, I don't know, Amber, is, I can unmute everybody. Oh, yes. Or I can mute all. Does anybody have any questions that they'd like to, to ask the whole group? I've unmuted everyone. Okay. You can uh, enter uh, your question to the chat if you prefer not to speak up as well. This is Seti. I don't have a question. But I just want to thank you for doing this webinar. It was very helpful. Thanks, Seti. Happy to do it. Brenda, was there anything that you wanted to add? 
No, I think you covered everything. I, I look forward to seeing all of your applications and meeting all of you. So don't, if you're not sure, do it, I guess is my thought. Like if you're on the edge, please submit would be my suggestion. So, so Brenda, Brenda Porter is professor of neurology at, and pediatrics at Stanford. Uh, and actually we were MSTPs together a long, long time ago. Brenda is, and Heather Fullerton are, are part of our executive committee that focuses on the uh, mentorship, advisorship, and sort of scholar uh, experience and applicant experience. So thank you. And Brenda does many of these webinars uh, for different topics for the CNCDP. Okay, any other questions? Are you planning ahead for how the retreat will look with COVID times or? Yeah, so, so um, we are linked to the Child Neurology Society and I should say that the Child Neurology Society for years, even prior to the CNCDP has provided in-kind support to uh, uh, what was then the Ansada retreat. So we're, we're tightly coupled with them mm -hmm. and they are, they are yet to determine, it'll, it's actually probably coming in the next week or so, what they're going to do. Uh, they're planning in parallel uh, an on-site and a hybrid and a, um, a completely virtual meeting. This year the Child Neurology Society is, is linked to the uh, International Child Neurology Association, so that adds some level of complexity. We will follow their, their lead. Um, if that, that meeting goes virtual, we will go virtual too. If they go hybrid with a small on-site and large uh, virtual version, we may not parallel that. We might just go fully virtual ourselves. We understand that institutions are gonna be very heterogeneous in their willingness to support travel. Um, not just in terms of letting you travel <laughs> for work-related activities, but also to, to uh, outlay expenses for, uh, for any travel-related activities. The applicants are, are, are covered by, the, by our program, but other aspects of the travel, like going to the meeting itself, might not, for you might not be. So we understand there's all that variability. So we are... Uh, ready to turn this retreat into a virtual version. I think most of us have become quite a, a, a accustomed to uh, sitting at our desks all day long on virtual meetings. And um, if that's what has to happen for the CNCP, that's, that's what we'll do. Thank you. Do you have the exact dates of when the, the retreat would be? I think it's this. October 17th through 19th, That's Amber, is that right? That is right. 17th through 19th. Yeah. Yeah, 17th through 19th. What's the percentage of letters of intent that get invited to full application? I'd say 95%, 98%, something like that. So uh, not a high bar. Just got to meet those criteria and, you know, write full sentences. <laughs> All right. Well, um, we'll give it a, another few seconds. Uh, and if there aren't other questions, I mean, I'm, happy to hang out and, and answer more questions and if they can be on the chat for uh, spoken and even if it's a detailed question or highly idiosyncratic go for it it, it may be that somebody else is thinking the same thing and this is a chance to have that discussion um aside from at the meeting in october when do we get feedback or um, like reviews on our applications that we submitted in August? So the, 
you will get the at the, at the actual retreat you'll get uh, a, a, a face to face kind of um, feedback with uh, you'll have an interview process where there'll be a, a couple of faculty who've read your application closely who will uh, have a discussion with you about the ideas in it and give feedback there. And then you'll get the result of the study sections uh, review as well. So at the retreat and then subsequent to the retreat, you'll get the, just like you would from a, uh, if you submitted an NIH grant, you'd get the, the, the pink sheets back. Um, what's different about this uh, process is that you're actually face to face with meeting the people who are reviewing. You're, you're, you're working together. Our, our intent is not to, to say, here's where you went awry with your application. Um, our intent is to, to, is to help you find a pathway to become an independent investigator. Our goal is that everybody who submits a letter of intent, if they don't get funded by us, they get funded by another mechanism that's a career development award uh, we want to see everybody succeed. Our, the purpose of the, the retreat process in all of its elements is, is for that goal. Um, but you won't get the, any feedback on your grant until actually showing up at the retreat. Okay, um, I think with that silence, that may say that we're, uh, we've uh, saturated information that you need right now. If you have questions subsequently, go ahead and, and email, send it to us at cncdpk12 at kennedykrieger.org email, and we'll get, get you an answer as soon as we can. And with that, I can say thank you all, and uh, see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And then I fix it.